Hello everyone. In this video, you will learn how to develop a web server in Flask. In the videos before, we have shown you how to retrieve and how to extract information from web pages using web scraping and beautiful soup. In the following videos, we will show you how you can develop your own web server in order to create dynamic websites and even user interface for your own script. Before we can start developing our web server, we need to understand the underlying concepts on the web. This figure visualizes the steps that happen when you request a website using a web browser. You as a, you as a user type in a URL into your web browser. The web browser sends a so-called HTTP request to a web server. That web server generates the HTML content that the browser requested and sends the HTML content back to the browser using an HTTP re response. Finally, the browser visualizes the HTML code. The protocol that is used to communicate between the web browser and the web server is called the hypertext transfer protocol. It is a request-based protocol, which means that the client has to make requests to the server and the server responses with an answer. There are four main request types that the client can make. The get request is used if the client wishes to get data from the data. This is typically used when you request. The post request is used when the client wants to send data to the server. This is, for instance, used when you sign in to a web service. The third request method is the put method, which is similar to the post method, but is used when new content is created with the request. And the delete method is used when the client asks to delete data on the server. In most cases, one uses a web browser to make these requests. But as a developer, it is often useful to be able to make requests also using the command line. The relevant command to make requests is called the curl, curl command. I use the minus V flag to activate the verbose mode in order to see some additional information. I use the minus X flag to specify that I want to make a get request. And the final argument is the server address for which we want to make the get request. Once I pr press return, I can see exactly what is going on. Any line that starts with a larger sign means that information was sent to the server. Any line that starts with a smaller sign is data that the server sent back to us. In the first few lines, in the first few lines, you can see that our curl command makes a get request using the HTTP 1.1 protocol. Further down, we can see the response that Google sent us. Further down, we can see some meta information that the Google server sent to us. In particular, that the web page was permanently moved to a different address and that the response is in the HTML format. If we move further down, we finally come to the actual HTML content that the server sent back to us. So now we want to develop our own web server. In Python, we have a range of different library, libraries that can be used to develop a web server. But in this video, I decided to show you Flask. The main reasons why I think Flask is a good choice to get started with developing a web server is because it is very minimalistic and easy to learn on the one hand, on the one hand, but at the same time can be extended to even very complex applications if necessary. You can use Flask, for instance, to build a static website, for instance, a blog or a private homepage. You can also use it to develop a dynamic website, for instance, a user interface to one of your scripts, or you can use it to build an API server so that you can make your script available to other web services. Some of the key features that Flask has is that it comes with an integrated development server and debugger, making it, making it very easy to get started with the development. It also has some integrated support for unit testing and is of course open source. On the other side, it has no advanced features like integrations or abstraction layers for database, no validations for forms. If you need such features, you need to use additional Python packages. The installation of Flask is as usual if you have Conda, you can just use Conda install Flask. If you have pip, you can use pip install Flask. Now let us implement our first web server. The web server is written as a normal Python script. Here I call it hello world.py. The first thing that we need to do is to import the Flask package. Next, we create an instance of the Flask class and store it in the app variable. The first argument is needed so that Flask knows where to look for templates, static files, and so on. If you are using a single module like I do here, simply use the underscore underscore name underscore underscore. You will learn more about templates later. Next, we create a function called hello 
that simply returns the string hello world. We want our web server to execute the hello function and return the string hello world. But how does Flask know that it should execute the hello function? To achieve that, we need to decorate that function with a Flask specific decorator. The route decorator tells Flask what URL should trigger our function. In this case, the hello function is called if a request to the root domain name is made. By default, Flask answers to get requests and then responses with the return value of the function. Later, we will also learn how to make Flask respond to other types of requests. Finally, we need to start our server, for which we use the app.run function. Now we can execute our script, and we see that the web server is running on this particular address. And when I open a web browser using this URL, I get our expected hello world response. There are two more tricks that I would like to show you for the run function. The first one is the debug equals true flag. If you set this flag, then the server will show you an additional detailed error output in the case of errors happens, and it will also automatically reload the server if you make changes to the code. This is particularly useful during the development because any code changes are immediately reflected when you reload the page in the browser. The second trick shows you how to make your web server available to the entire network. By default, the web server only accepts connection from your own computer because of security reasons. However, if you are in a private environment and you want to make your website available to other clients, you need to add this flag. Keep in mind, however, that this will allow anyone in your network to access the web server, which might be a se severe security risk. So only do this in your own private network. Now let's imagine we want to develop a website with users. Our usernames and users are stored in a dictionary like this. As a first step, we would like to create a new subpage that lists all the users in our system. To achieve that, we define a new function. In this case, we call it show user overview. Note that the name of the function does, however, not matter to Flask. The key thing, however, is that we decorate that function with a route decorator. And now we ask Flask to respond to any requests to the slash user URL. The function itself generates some simple HTML that joins all the users in our dictionary. Now we can go back to our browser and request the user URL. And you can see we get the nice overview of users in our system. As a next step, we might want to show some additional information for each user. For instance, if I visited slash users slash Richard, I would like to see the information of the user Richard. To achieve that, we add one additional function to our file. Again, we use the route decorator to specify to which URLs Flask should respond to. But in this case, the URL definition contains a variable since we do not know the name of the user in advance. When a request is made, then the value of this placeholder is passed in is passed in as the first argument into our function. In the example just now, the username would have the value Richard. With that information, we could use the username to retrieve some additional information and return the relevant HTML content. In our case, we keep things simple and simply show the username in the returned HTML page. Now let's try to make this slash user slash Richard request and see if it works. And indeed, we get the expected answer. One downside with our current solution is that we have to generate HTML file using standard Python string ma manipulation, which can become quite lengthy and it also become and the code be can become quite confusing if one mixes large Python and H HTML code. For this reason, Flask comes with a concept called templates. The idea of a template is that instead of generating HTML code using Python string manipulation, that we write the HTML code in its own template file, as shown here. The special thing about this template is that it can have it can have placeholders for variables denoted by double curly brackets. So in this list, we will inject the value of the user variable, and we can also loop over variables, such as in this case, where we loop over all the users in, our, in a user's table. So in other words, a template is a parameterized HTML document. In order for Flask to find the templates, they need to be stored in a subdirectory called templates. In my case, I called the file templates slash users.html. 
back in our Python code, I can now remove the string manipulation that we did before. And instead I can use the render template function that takes in the file name of the template and the variables that I want to have filled in. Since I want to loop over all the users in the system, I pass in the users dictionary. And when we execute this, we see that we still get our nice users list. That's it for me today. How, and next time I will teach you how you can set content from the client to the server.